the simplest example, and that will lead to a set of uh, rather general kinds of differential equations um, which in, encode somehow the full structure of these terms, the full dependence on the moduli, in this case, the complex coupling constant. Um, in the second part of the talk, I mean, th these equations will be somewhat um, general, and their coefficients in the equations will not be determined by and large. I'll give some examples where they can be determined, um, but that will lead on to specific sort of model description of these equations that arises in trying to understand the duality between supergravity and string theory. Um, M theory in 11 dimensions compactified on a torus, to be specific. Um, and then, in the last part of the talk, I will, um, as part of the same discussion, um, say something about um, the connection with maximal supergravity and therefore with the ultraviolet divergence properties, which may or may not have some connection with the last part of what Lance Dixon was talking about. So let me uh, begin with the first part. Um, the low energy expansion of string theory, as we all know, is an alpha prime expansion in which the successive terms have higher derivatives and the kinds, of, uh, the kinds of terms one gets, for example, are corrections to the Einstein-Hilbert term with, uh, in the type 2b case or the type 2 theories and r to the fourth term with a coefficient which is a function of the moduli and that coefficient encodes both the perturbative and non-perturbative um, terms that you would get from string theory calculations. Um, this series, of course, um, well, apart from being interesting just as a, describing the structure of the theory, may also be useful for certain kinds of applications um, in which um, non-leading terms in the um, curvature become important. I'll say, I won't say very much about that. Um, just to set the scene of notation, let me remind you the type 2b theory has um, uh, the following set of fields. The scalars, which I'm calling omega for a particular reason in this talk, um, the complex scalar um, sits in a coset, um, and the coset being um, SL2R V1, and then there's a set of um, bosonic and fermionic fields, and in particular, they carry a charge, um, which, uh, a U1 charge, which is associated with the U1 charge, in the, the U1 in the coset, um, and then most importantly, um, in string theory and in fact in quantum supergravity, we know uh, that that, that, that um, continuous SL2R um, has to be modded out by the SL2Z. You have to identify the scalar fields under SL2Z. And that follows, well in string theory, it's, it's, it's explicit in the theory. Um, the theory is only invariant under this discrete symmetry. Um, in quantum supergravity, we know it because there's an anomaly in um, in that U1 current, which um, is consistent with this particular coset. Um, I want to discuss higher derivative terms beyond the classical supergravity terms. Um, and th th uh, those are, let's see if I can work this thing. Um, so in general, there'll be some uh, product like R to the fourth or some some function like lambda six lambda is the Dilatino, there'll be some power of the various fields in the theory, which I'll call P, and that'll be characterized by a, 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 a having a U1 charge U and having some dimension uh, delta, which is related to N, where N was the power of alpha prime that we're talking about. Now, as I just said, the theory is invariant under um, this discrete SL2Z duality symmetry, which means that when you write down a generic term in the action involving um, this combination P, um, then since P carries a, a non-trivial U charge, which is a, um, uh, the U, the, the, a, a, a generic SL2Z transformation will transform P non-trivially, so that the coefficient function has to transform correspondingly in order to make the whole thing invariant. And so F has to be some sort of modular form um, in the notation I'm using, it has to be a modular form which transforms with a phase, the phase being determined by U, and so it has to have equal and opposite holomorphic and anti-holomorphic weights and transform in this manner. So these coefficient functions F <coughs> contain a huge amount of information about the particular terms in these series. And the question is, how, what, how are the Fs constrained by supersymmetry? Let me stress that...
Fs are not holomorphic. Um, and the situation... So the situation here is very different from, from um, examples with less supersymmetry where holomorphicity plays an important role in constraining the corresponding coefficient functions. So let me just give this sketchy argument about how you can find out something about how supersymmetry controls these functions. What we want to do is add um, terms to the classical action which are higher order in alpha prime, so we want the complete action will be some sort of sum over the alpha prime series, all, all n, and correspondingly, the supersymmetry transformations will be modified order by order in alpha prime, um, uh, hence the sum over delta m. And we want to impose supersymmetry at all orders, um, and at the same time, we need to impose closure of the superalgebra, um, which for this kind of um, system means closure on the um, super, on, on, the delta set to close on the translations up to equations of motion and gauge transformations. And these, these conditions strongly constrain the form of F. Unfortunately, they're, of course, extremely difficult to implement since we don't have a superspace formalism um, in which to do it. Um, and the, uh, the presence of these deltas in particular indicates that there are complicated um, modifications to, uh, for example, the torsion constraints that one might have imposed. Um, so let me now proceed, um, nevertheless, in this very general sense, and then give some examples. Um, the structure of the classical, the zeroth order um, transformations um, is as described here. There is some transformation on the, um, on the scalars, which has this form, and then a transformation on, on any, of the other, any of the other fields which carry a U1 charge U, any of the other fields I listed in my previous um, transparency, has one piece which I've called delta hat, which preserves the U-symmetry, and then there's a, a piece which is uh, present because we're talking about the theory in a, uh, on, uh, in, uh, where we've gone to the coset, where we fix the U1 gauge, if you like, and therefore there's a compensating gauge transformation that's associated with any supersymmetry transformation. And that has this form here. So applying delta zero to an arbitrary term in that sum, um, it gives two kinds of terms. Either delta zero hits this expression P, or it hits F. When it hits F, it varies the omega inside the F, and you get a covariant derivative, or you get an ordinary derivative on F, but then the pieces, the compensating U1 transformations, add together to covariantize the derivative. So the, so the important point is the structure of a variation of an arbitrary term has two kinds of terms. It's got a covariant derivative on F, where the covariant derivative this is a modular covariant derivative which acts on any function of spin u, changing it to u plus 1. And then there's a piece which involves a variation of p. And these terms have to, these are two pieces of delta s. As I say, I'm being very sketchy, so I can't go through all the details. In addition to delta 0 sn, there are terms with non zero m, you have to add up all those up. But um, when the dust settles, you can see that the general structure of the condition for supersymmetry is an equation of the form some covariant derivative on f, and I'm, dropping, I'm suppressing all sorts of indices and uh, all the coefficients, but some sort of uh, covariant derivative on f relates it to f plus um, some source terms which are polynomials in the lower lying f's. So at any given order n, there's an equation which relates the covariant derivative of f to, um, to products of the lower order coefficients. And, in, and then if you, you can convert this into a Laplace equation or Poisson equation by acting with d bar on it, and then you get an equation for d bar df, which has the sim, a similar sort of structure. So that the generic structure of the equations that emerge are Laplace equations, inhomogeneous Laplace equations um, of this form. And these equations have a lot of structure Unfortunately, as I said, the generic equation of this type, I can't, write, I can't tell you what the um, coefficients are because it's too complicated. So that for much of what I'm going to say now, I'm going to go to specific examples, which can be analyzed in detail. So let me now go back to the most simple examples. So I should have stressed that these f's that I, wrote, that I defined at the beginning here um, have an index they, 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 they're not just a, uh, they're indexed by the dimension or the alpha prime power n, 
and the U1 charge, but then for any given dimensional in charge, there may be a degeneracy factor, there may be several different terms of the same, uh, with the same charge and, um, and dimension, and that's, that's um, what I call a degeneracy index um, I, but in the simplest examples are non-degenerate, and the, there are no, and, and there are no um, quadratic or cubic or whatever source terms. The, the equation is simply linear in F. And then you get a Poisson equation by acting with d bar on this one and then using this equation, you get a Poisson equation, a Poisson eigenvalue equation. And examples of that are known where, for example, when u is zero, um, they, uh, um, it, there are examples in which um, this, uh, this operator is then the, simply the Laplacian acting on f is some eigenvalue times f. And this is an equation whose solution is an Eisenstein series. Um, and mathematically, this is of interest. I mean, these Eisenstein series, of course, are ancient history mathematically, but they're of interest partly because they are modular extensions of the Riemann zeta values. If you expand this in, in what we would call the coupling constant, the inverse of omega 2, then the leading term is a zeta function. Um, but the whole series, which involves, uh, the whole series has uh, one power, a leading power, which we would call tree level, and then another power, which I will later identify with a genus. A, a, a loop term in, in string theory. So omega 2, remember, is the inverse of the string coupling. So this is a power series in string coupling with only two powers. So there is no, there's a sort of non-renormalization here. There are no powers beyond the genus S minus a half term. Um, but there are inst instantonic terms which we would identify with D instantons in string theory. Um, examples of this, which have been, I mean, this is, this is a fairly old story now, um, are the, uh, the R to the fourth expression itself, which has the three halves Eisenstein series. And three, you can see here that's got a genus zero, a tree level, and a one loop term. So this tells you that there cannot be any terms beyond one loop with R to the fourth. This is extremely pertinent to the last part of my talk when I'm going to talk about, say something about um, the perturbative expansion of supergravity. Um, but um, where something, all, I, all I'm using here is supersymmetry, so it wouldn't be surprising if the same statement is true in supergravity, that, um, that there is a um, one loop term, but there are no terms beyond one loop. Um, the other example of this type is um, four derivatives, or S squared on R to the fourth, which has another Eisenstein series, which only has a two loop term. Uh, it has a tree level, and when, when S is five halves, it's a two loop term. Um, there are also processes at this order, n equals 3, at, well, at the same order as r to the fourth, in which u is non-zero. Examples of such processes are the lambdas of the 16th, that the 16 dilatini violates the u charge by 24 units, and, um, and, and g to the eighth violates it by 8 units. And the modular for forms there are simply given by t t acting u times with a covariant derivative on the, on the Eisenstein series. Um, e three halves. So those are the simplest examples. Um, a couple of years ago, um, Pierre van Hoven and I discovered um, a, a more complicated example, which illustrates something completely new, which is which I showed you earlier in the most general form in my in the e equation. I showed you the general form of the equations um, in which they were source terms, which were bilinear in lower order coefficients. Well, here's the simplest example of that. When you get to n equals six six derivatives and after the fourth, you start getting quadratic terms um, for, due to the um, uh, lower order n equals three coefficients. And qualitatively speaking, that arose from the supersymmetry discussion I had earlier, because when you get to this order, you can, do a, a, you, you can mix the supersymmetry transformation on this coefficient um, with the third order supersymmetry transformations on the third order terms in the action. In other words, the R to the fourth term mixes with this term under the modified supersymmetry. So you start to get terms of this type. This is, this is an equation which has a very rich set of solutions. There are other equations, up, up to recently, very recently, um, there were no other very explicit examples, but at least, uh, 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 a week or so ago, Basu and Sethi produced a paper giving examples of such a thing with um, 
a general class of terms of, but with maximally non-zero U, and which in some sense generalize terms which were written down a long time ago by Berkowitz and Waffer, um, but although Basu and Sethi's terms are slightly different. And then there are more generally degenerate cases where the Fs have index J and where the right hand side then has, has, has a rather more complicated structure. There's some matrices connecting the um, bilinears in F where these Fs are lower, lower order source coefficients. But these are very difficult to um, analyze explicitly as this was as well. So the, the, the way in which we obtain this and the way in which you, we can obtain examples of this is what I'm going to talk about now in the second part of my talk. Um, let, me, uh, let me just add the comment that uh, it's at this point that um, one sees something in, of interest, apparently, mathematically, because whereas the Riemann zeta values are generalized, by the Eisenstein, generalized in an SO2z way by the Eisenstein series, um, this suggests something quite new, which is a generalization of multiple zeta values, which is Zagier's sort of bread and butter, um, in some, to some modular invariant extension. And so we've been analyzing, well, this equation in particular, but these equations um, in some detail without any specific results yet. Um, but the way in which we've obtained examples of such equations is what I wanted to rapidly go through now, um, which is based on looking at the four graviton amplitude, because we, th these examples are all of the form r to the fourth, or derivatives on r to the fourth, where r to the fourth is a contraction of four vial curvatures with the same tensors that um, Lance Dixon was just talking about. Um, the um, the um, what it, some, of, some of what's known comes from string perturbation theory, although it's somewhat difficult to extract. So at tree level, the um, four-point function, of course, has been known for many, many years, since the beginnings of string theory. Um, and... Um, and it can be analyzed completely. You can expand it to all orders in a series in alpha prime, and you can look at the coefficients, and I just haven't got time to describe them here. They're very beautiful, if you think, if you see beauty in these things. Um, they are combinations, that the coefficients are typically rational numbers times powers of zeta functions, and the origin of those powers of zeta functions is supposed to, in, in our way of thinking, is supposed to be um, seen from these equations. Um, one loop is much more difficult to analyze because in one loop in string theory you're integrating four vertex operators on a torus and you have to, when you do the low energy expansion, you have to integrate over the torus, the positions on the torus and, and, and the shape of the torus. And that's tricky and I'm going to just flash by a transparency to show you the sort of results we're gonna, we, we have. Um, a two loop, two loop um, st string amplitudes um, exist explicitly but are difficult to analyze, and to my knowledge, very, very little has been explicitly analyzed for two loops, although much more could be. Um, the reason for looking at perturbation theory is simply to get some data, some facts, that we want to match, or we would like to match, with the exact non-perturbative expressions. Um, so let me flash by, uh, just to show you the, something about the genus 1 amplitude, and also because this was so much work, I can't go by without describing it. Um, so what, what we did um, recently was um, uh, expand far beyond what had been done before the um, amplitude, the one loop amplitude of string theory, which is this integral over the, tor the world sheet torus, tau. Um, it's an expansion in ST and U, but actually for very general reasons, um, the ST and U always occur in the combination sigma 2 and sigma 3, which is S squared plus T squared plus U squared or S cubed plus T cubed plus U cubed. So this is a double expansion in sigma 2 and sigma 3. And these particular coefficients we've extracted with, with great uh, labor. Um, and as you see, there are, Z well, some of them are vanish, which is interesting for reasons I won't go into. Um, uh, uh, then there's some zeta values, and then they're, combina then they're products of zeta values, which are, in fact, re-expressible as multi uh, multiple zeta values. Um, and it's, these, it's this kind of thing which one um, wants to get out from these equations. Now, I'm, this transparency is not to be absorbed in detail, but just to show you, we've also, we've also compactified on a circle, and we've got a huge number of terms which now depend on the radius of the circle, and there's a very intriguing pattern of coefficients, which I won't go into. Uh, once again, they are products of zeta values um, times rational coefficients. Uh, compactifying on a circle, though, is of relevance to what I'm going to say, because I'm going to now go on to talk about M-theory um, compactified on a 
torus, which is supposed to be equivalent to this. So, and, and the reason for doing that is because we would like to find out the non-perturbative completion of these terms. So the terms I've described so far up to, up to this order, the ones I mentioned earlier, are the r to the fourth and d to the fourth r to the fourth, with these Eisenstein series. d to the sixth r to the fourth is the next one up, um, and that has the um, solution of that equation I showed you earlier. Um, what I'm not talking about is, of course, there's, there's a great deal more to this subject. At any given order, including r to the fourth, very little is known about the complete series of terms related by supersymmetry. Very little indeed, although something is known. Um, for example, the only thing I, the only, in fact, my belief is that the only thing that's known exactly is that if you switch off all the fluxes except F5, the generalization of r to the fourth is known, and that's proved useful recently in, 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 um, understanding something about the um, plasma viscosity in ADS CFT. But I'm not going to talk about that here. This one's in brackets. Um, so how do we find out anything about these higher derivative interactions, short of solving the equations that I told you about earlier? Well, what we've done over a long time now is consider the connection between string theory and M theory um, defined by 11-dimensional supergravity in some approximation um, where um, we are using the Feynman rules of supergravity. So let me remind you that supergravity on a uh, M theory on a two, two torus is supposed to be equivalent to type 2 string theory on a circle. The volume of the torus is given in terms of the type 2b parameters by some expression like this. The complex structure of the torus becomes a complex coupling constant. And then if you shrink the torus to zero volume, that's equivalent to going to the type 2b 10-dimensional limit. If you, sh if you um, expand one radius of the torus to infinite radius, you get the type 2a theory. But then you can ask, what about quantum effects? Uh, so what time did I start? Uh, five minutes. I started, I started five minutes late. What? Did I start five minutes late? Yeah, that's why yeah. I have five minutes. <laughs> so, um, so the idea is to try and calculate... Um, uh, corrections to the classical theory by looking at quantum effects. Now, quantum effects, of course, we're talking about 11-dimensional supergravity on a two-torus, so that we have to be worried about ultraviolet divergences. Um, so let's just regulate them at some momentum scale lambda and see what happens. Each diagram has a naive degree of divergence, which is, um, which is given by this formula here at L loops. There's lambda to d minus 2 L plus 2. But the actual degree of divergence is much less because there's a factor of r to the fourth that comes outside always, which is eight powers of momentum. And then as you get to higher and higher numbers of loops, you get higher and higher powers of st and u, which, um, which reduces the degree of divergence even further. So the divergences will, in principle, of course, we don't, of course, expect to describe m theory by supergravity. And in particular, since the theory is divergent, we need to subtract the divergences and introduce counter terms. We don't know, what, in general, this will introduce unknown coefficients, which presumably encode details about the short distance features of M theory. Nevertheless, at low orders in this expansion, it's remarkable that many of these counter terms, several of these counter terms, can be fixed by simply demanding that the results should agree with string theory results, um, in the, stru the structure of the results should agree with, with, with the structure of string theory. The simplest examples, which I'm going to have to flash through, um, uh, are the, uh, uh, come from one loop. So at one loop, in, on a two torus, this is an old story, the loop can wind around the two torus in, in two different directions. So there are two winding numbers, m and n. And when you work out um, the result, you find that for the leading term at, la at small st and u, the leading term um, is indeed has an Eisenstein series with some power of the volume of the torus times r to the fourth, and that is indeed exactly what you'd get. Um, that exactly reproduces what was known about the r to the fourth term in string theory. So if I translate from M theory to string theory, I get this term in string theory, which is exactly, contains exactly the string theory tree level and genus one pieces. Um, let me flash through. Now you've got a two loops, which is the um, two loop supergravity was described as, as Lance Dixon has just uh, reviewed um, by these people. Um, this time, 
The diagrams have an r to the fourth and an s squared outside. Again, just like in the, the one loop diagram case, these are scalar field theory diagrams, so they're rather easy to evaluate. The difficulty is evaluating them compactified on a torus. Now you have to sum over four windings. Um, and when you do that, and when you're careful about subtracting the correct counter term, you end up um, with, with very specific coefficients. Let me, I'd like to, although there's no time to go into this in detail, I'd like to just show you why the results come out so elegantly. And it's to do with the fact that a two-loop diagram can be redefined. The, the integration over the Schrodinger parameters for the, these three legs, four particles are placed on three legs of the diagram, the integration of the three legs can be re-parameterized in terms of three variables we call V, tau 1, and tau 2, um, where tau 1 and tau 2 behave exactly as if they were the complex structure of a torus. There is no torus here, of course, because these are Feynman diagrams. But nevertheless, the integration over the three Schrodinger parameters reduces to an integration, it can be reduced to an integration over the fundamental domain of a torus, parameterized by tau, and a volume V. And it's because of that, and because the target space is also a torus, that the, in the end, you're mapping a, what, a sort of a, an intrinsic torus into a target space torus, and that's why the numbers come out well. And what happens, in a nutshell, is that the amplitude, the dependence on st and u, is some specific function, which now is a sum of terms, each one of which satisfies a Laplace equation with a source. So that was the, that was, uh, maybe that, that's where, um, I, I shouldn't go into any more details in this part of the talk, simply say that those two loop diagrams illustrate the general feature that I showed you earlier, that you get some degeneracy of the modular functions now are degenerate. There's a specific number, and I haven't told you what the number is, but we know exactly what it is for any term in this expansion. We can expand the two-loop diagram up essentially to any order we wish, and we get at each order a, a, a set of um, um, Laplace equations with source terms where the sources and the, and, the, um, and the eigenvalues depend on which of the functions we're talking about. Um, now, I did prepare some detailed examples of this, but maybe I would skip them in order to get to the last part of the talk. So, the last part of the talk is to do with the possible connections with supergravity um, in arbitrary dimensions. Um, and that has to do with what happens beyond two loops. So, at one and two loops, um, things are very clean and you can do these very detailed calculations. At three loops, we now have an expression, thanks to these people last year, um, Byrne, Dixon, et al., um, uh, who had an explicit construction, so one could, in principle, repeat what I've just said. Um, the important thing is that at three loops, there's an extra power of s. And at high loops, there may be further powers of s. And the issue which is being addressed by people who are, are interested in whether supergravity is more finite than it might have been expected to be, can be rephrased as the question of how many powers of s are there at any given loop. Because the more powers of s there are outside the integral, the, le the more finite the integral. So um, the statement here is that by continuing to make these connections between supergravity and string theory, there are consistency conditions which, at least subject to very important assumptions, seem to constrain the possible powers of S. To get to that, let me begin by just a simple dimensional argument. So here is a generic L-loop diagram in supergravity, and it's got a naive degree of divergence, which is some power of lambda, which is that, which I've mentioned already. That's very naive because, in fact, there'll be a power of R to the fourth outside at the front, which is eight powers of momentum, and then there'll be some unknown power of s, at, which depends on the number of loops, which will reduce the divergence. So the whole question is, what is the value of beta l at any loop order? And so let me give you a potted history of the values of beta l between 1982, when the one-loop calculation was done, and 2006, when the three-loop calculation was done. So at one loop, beta l is zero, and the answer is r to the fourth. Two loops was done 10 years later, uh, sorry, 16 years later, uh, 10 years ago, and these people found an S squared R to the fourth. The important point there is R to the fourth never occurs after this. So R to the fourth is protected 
from getting any contribution beyond one loop. I've already said that based on supersymmetry. But this is explicitly true in the multi-loop calculations done in the, over this period. Which means that R to the fourth cannot be renormalized beyond one loop. Which means that discussion about a three-loop counterterm, R to the fourth counterterm, is redundant at that point. Since it can't be renormalized beyond one loop, there can't be an R to the fourth counterterm of three loops. Similarly, the three loop term has an extra power of S out front. Um, and therefore, S squared R to the fourth is not renormalized beyond two loops. Another thing we saw in the modular function that described S squared R to the fourth earlier, but now it's explicit. And that means that S squared R to the fourth cannot be renormalized beyond two loops, and therefore a putative five loop counterterm of the form S squared R to the fourth simply can't exist because S squared R to the fourth doesn't occur at five loops. N equals 4 hasn't yet been calculated, but I'm assuming these people who've done these very, very impressive calculations will do that soon. And I'm further assuming there'll be an extra power of S, which is an assumption that maybe I shouldn't be making. But if it's true that there's an extra power of S, then we'll also find that there's no six-loop contribution. It means that S cubed out of the fourth is not renormalized beyond six loops. Um, so there's no counterterm. So, and you go on like this, and you wonder where is it going to stop. Well, these direct calculations are extremely impressive for various reasons, not just to do with these divergences, but they're very difficult to do. Um, and I suspect there are not many people in the world who can do them. However, there, is an ind there are some indirect arguments, um, which um, let me quickly review and then stop. Um, there was an argument, an impressive argument in the Berkowitz a couple of years ago, based on utilizing his um, pure spin-off formalism. Um, but it's a zero-mode argument. It only use it, so although it's phased in a stringy language, it's a zero-mode counting argument, fermionic mode counting argument, which suggests that this pattern of S, putting on an extra power of S for each loop will continue such that up to five loops, the five-loop term is not renormalized by any successive loops. In other words, S to the fifth R to the fourth um, it comes out at five loops, and therefore at six loops, which is the point at which his formalism can't say anything at the moment. Um, there has to be a power of at least s to the 6. Um, and, and then beyond that, we don't know, because he, he hasn't anything to say beyond it. But that's where, naively, his supersymmetric formalism breaks down. So based on his version of supersymmetry, there is a non-renormalization theorem here, which we then interpreted in the way I've just described, as power counting. You put out six powers of s, and you discover the first, loop, the first divergence can only occur in nine loops. Which I put in, in, in a rectangle here simply because um, of all the things I'm saying here, the only thing which I firmly believe is that there won't be a divergence before nine loops. Now, I would have said I wouldn't believe anyone would ever calculate the nine loop thing, but I'm not so sure, having heard the previous talk. The, the, but um, at the moment, that seems a long way away from testing directly. Um, let me add the corollary, which is the subject of the paper we wrote a couple of years ago, which is that if you pull out a factor of S for all loops, in other words, beyond five loops, and we gave an argument motivated by the kind of dualities I mentioned earlier, based on looking at Feynman diagrams in 11 dimensions compactified on a circle to give the type 2A string theory, and then taking the low energy limit of type 2A string theory, we gave an argument for why this might be true to all orders. If that's true, then in any, or any loop, the divergence has this power of lambda, and then the condition that the divergence should not be there is the condition that the dimension d should be less than 4 plus 6 over L. And this coincides precisely with the condition in maximal super yang, yang mills. As, and in fact, the examples given by um, Lance Dixon earlier are examples of this uh, agreement at, at low numbers of loops um, with their specific calculations. So I don't want to claim this as a proof. I'd be in trouble if I did, so I thought, it, but it's, it's, it's all slightly surreal, which reminded me of something, so I, um, um, it reminded me of um, the statement that this pipe isn't a pipe, so I, um, let me say the proof, it's not really a proof. Um, you might say, and one more minute. <laughs> you might say, so what? I mean, what, what would the implication be of n equals 8 supergravity being finite? One implication might be taken to mean that what on earth are we doing 
what have we been doing for the last, goodness knows how many years, looking at string theory, which was, had this virtue that it was finite to all orders of perturbation theory. What would it mean if there was another theory that was finite? Well, I don't have much to say about that, but let me just comment that, and this is based on work I did with Hiroshi Aguri and John Schwartz um, a year and a half ago, that if you start from string theory and ask the question, how would you get supergravity out of string theory, quantum supergravity, then you discover that you can't. In other words, you can't decouple maximal supergravity as a quantum field theory, in other words, with just the massless perturbative excitations, from closed string theory, at least when the dimension of space-time is bigger than three. Because what happens is, when you try to take the decoupling limit, then you can't... Uh, the decoupling limit is supposed to result in a theory which only has the massless supermultiplet of supergravity in it, but what you find is that you get infinite tiles of other states, the non-perturbative states, D-brains or another Schwartz brains or Pitzer Klein monopoles or whatever, um, there's always some tower which becomes massless at the same time. So there is no decoupling limit, which suggests to me and to the string theorist, I think, that it doesn't make sense to talk about supergravity in isolation from string theory. Now, you might ask, what is the symptom? If you're a supergravity theorist, why should you care about this argument? Well, of course, I can't give a specific answer to that, but there seem to be two possibilities. One is, of course, the theory may not be finite in perturbation theory, in which case, of course, you, you have to use string theory. We have no alternative. The other possibility is that even if it's finite in perturbation theory, the perturbation expansion may have no region of validity because of the existence of these huge tower of what are BPS states in the theory. Um, this, is, this is very different, of course, from Yang-Mills. In Yang-Mills, we know that there is a decoupling limit in which you can decouple the Yang-Mills theory from open string theory. So that's um, that. Um, so that's the end of my talk. <laughs> this is a prediction based on past experience, assuming that the for loop, I don't know where, what Lance would say to this, but it, it, assuming that the four loop calculation will be done in the year 2010, there's a series that converges to all of this by the year 2004. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Comments, questions? Everyone seems to have understood all the details. Oh, Luis. You calculated using the spin of velocity. When you calculated. When you calculated. It should be on. Huh. Yes. When you calculated the four graviton one loop amplitude, did you con could you contemplate using a spinner helicity formulation for that? Would that make it easier? The calculation I talked about was in higher dimensions, so that the notion. I mean, the, the four-dimensional helicity formalism is so... Right. Well, can you speak? In, in calculating those uh, kind of periods in terms, you use the SL2C variance, string theory. Now, for gravity, you would expect all the counter, all these kind of relative terms, or any counter term, to be E7 invariant. Can you use the same techniques to? No, but well, well, it's an interesting issue which we've been discussing actually in the last couple of days. In ten, you might have asked in ten dimensions. Can you see from super? I mean, super gravity in ten dimensions, of course, is highly divergent. However, the question about you can ask the question: How does super gravity know that SL2R is broken? The continuous symmetry is broken in SL2Z. And there's an anomaly that does that. So even within supergravity, that anomaly is surely there in four dimensions as well. That there's an anomaly, a one-loop Chiron anomaly, which um, which will break that. Um, See, it's worth. Sergio. I think to complement the question of uh, Jean Maldacena, I mean, in four dimension, directly if you are in four dimension, this SL2Z will be replaced by e, E7 discrete symmetry. Right. So probably you will have a similar object uh, in four dimension. Yeah. 
yeah. with the modular form of EZ, of E7Z. I, yes, I agree. Yeah. Well, I thought the question was, how, starting with supergravity, do you know that the continuous symmetry is not a symmetry of the theory? And all I was saying is there's an anomaly which prevents it being... Yeah. Okay, I think we should thank the speaker again.